And we told you it was coming. Jeff, I've known about this collection that you've had of one particular comic book for quite a long time. It was one of the first, you know, things you, you know, we, we, we start building a friendship. You don't always show every single person what, what books you have in your home or wherever you keep them. You know, you, you, you kind of keep that reserved. But you get to know people you want to share, you know. And I wanted to know what kind of stuff you had. You're the Golden Age guru. And one of the first things you showed off was your collection of Hulk 181s. I want to chat about with that with you today. I want to introduce the comic fam to this collection you've been building, give them some ideas about why, how long, how much, because you're going to be grading all these copies. What do you got? All right, so look, I'm the Golden Age guru, and I love Golden Age, but my second favorite time frame is the Bronze Age. Which is so interesting. You skip the silver. I mean, we all love some good silver, but what about the Bronze Age do you like so much? I just love the creativity. Um, I love the artwork. I just feel like it's more relatable um, and just to digest in reading. But yeah, mostly the creativity of the new characters and, and the artwork. I just liked it more than Silver Age. Silver Age is great, too. But Bronze Age for me is just a lot more fun to collect and I enjoy it more. So it's like the grittiness, you know, the power, the the particular characters were more raw in the Bronze Age because these writers were given way more creative freedom, you know, utilizing horror themes and and mystery themes and then creating such, um, you know, like going against the grain type of superhero, specifically Logan, which is what we're looking at. Yeah. So I have 22 Hulk ones here. Okay, and I think I have a 23rd somewhere, but we got 22 here. It was an interesting time going to that short box when you pulled it out, and I'm like, oh, what am I looking at? What collection is this? You're like, oh, that's just my Wolverine books. And they're all the same books. Yeah, <laughs> we don't even talk about the 180s. Uh, we'll get into Hit that. Hit the subscribe button, time. Comic Fam. That's coming for another, uh, another day. You know, I started really diving back into comics in like 05, 06, and really just hit the ground running with like slinging dollar books, buying collections on Craigslist. And uh, eventually I just started, you know, coming across books. And I was at this point in my life where I had a job and money and I had 100% faith in Hulk 181 and Wolverine. Okay. This started back then? This started back then, probably really around 07, 08. Somewhere around then I really started to um, acquire as many of these as possible because they were, obviously they were a lot less than they are now. Sure. And I was trying to buy any copy I could, uh, $400 or less. Okay. And I was going on Craigslist, reaching out to P or eBay, I'm sorry, and reaching out to people and always trying to hustle as much as possible. And it was easier back then. Okay. But I remember constantly getting grief from people. Like, what are you doing? Why do you keep putting more of these in? Why you got to sell them, sell them, sell them, sell them. It's like, no. Okay. I don't want to sell them for years and years. It's to this day. Still, people are always just like, you know, Hey, you got to sell them. You got to, you got to get out now, get out now. I get asked quite a bit if I can ask the guru if he has a Hulk 181 or knows someone who has one that maybe they can hook up a deal on. And I always tell him the same thing. No. <laughs> Cause I yeah. know what you're going to say. You're going to I'd buy it if I, if I can get one, like you're just been a constant acquisition. Yeah. I was at the point where it's like, why am I even selling these? You know, I was like, I, I've sold a bunch. Too I've seen you younger. sell a few, but it's a long time I always, ago. But what would you do with that? You'd always try to find more. I remember getting like a, a seven, five, possible eight O with upgrade. Mm -hmm. And it was like a $600 book. And I felt weird about it. Like I had multiple dealers walking around and they're like, no, no, it's like maybe a little bit less here, maybe a little bit more here. Like they were all helping this person selling it at the time. Cause it, cause none of the dealers cared. They're like, oh yeah, this kid wants it. Cause at the time I wasn't like willing to, like, I was actually more like PC collecting, right? Like private collect, uh, personal collecting. And they were like, ah, oh, let the customer have it. And they were trying to help the seller figure out how much to charge because he was actually, you know, he didn't know what he had. So we were all making sure that he was, you know, we were doing this right. But this book wasn't expensive within many of our community's own lifetime. Yeah, I mean, the book is not what it was now. I mean, it was still a very popular, it was still a Bronze Age key. It was the Bronze Age key, but Bronze Age has expanded mm -hmm. and, you know, has the whole hobby has. And I mean, again, shout out to Ron Murray, okay, friend of the podcast, friend in person in real life, great guy, um, had a case of Hulk 181s. And these are talk, we're talking nine, six, nine, eights guys. And he sold them for $400 a pop for All a right? long time. Too. And that was a, that was a strong number at the he time. He would just bring them just raw. Yeah. He would just, he brought them. So, um, just give you an idea where the books came from then. I mean, my goal was to have a long box once of these, 
All right. And quickly that changed because prices changed really quick. And then happened short box. Really, really quick. Yeah. And so I don't think I've bought a whole Quinn 81 in probably four or five years now. I mean, most of these I've had since 2010, 11. I mean, just 12. I don't know. Somewhere around there. I've had them for a very long time. Um, haven't found many in collections either. But again, I've been hunting mostly Golden Age. And a lot of people know what they have with Hulk 81s these days anyway. So, um, but if I ever get one that makes sense, I'll keep it. But not any more with this stack. I'm not sure what I'm going to do, guys. I have some some plans for uh, an addition. So these mugs might all finally be going, which is a hard move for me and decision to make. But it feels right because it's for the right thing in my life. So we're going to grade 22 Hulk 21s. There's a couple that have already been graded, three of them, but we're going to crack those out and upgrade upgrade them because I think they're all upgradable by half a point potentially. Hulk 181 has absolutely gone up in value. It's also gone up in interest as you would expect. The thing that I find surprising is the amount a collector will tolerate as it pertains to grade on this Bronze Age key because there was a point when if you got hit with a copy that was missing that Marvel value stamp, it literally would be looked at as a key book that would be comparable to other key books that we value at as like $100 right now. Yeah, it was very difficult to move incomplete books because that value stamp basically made the book incomplete. And th which is funny that you mentioned that because that was the last Hulk when anyone ever bought. These all have Marvel value stamps except for one. And that was the last Hulk when anyone I bought maybe three years ago. Again, shout out to Silver Age Comics out in New York. To Gus. Gussie. I bought it from him. I mean, it's got a piece off the front cover missing and back cover. Yeah, we'll show it here in a second. Yeah, it's got issues um, on it and two clip coupons. But for like 300 bucks, you're like, it's a Hulk 181 regardless. But that gives you some perspective here because the last time you had an affordable copy presented that you actually pulled the trigger on, you went incomplete because that's all that was left. And I think... Fast forwarding three years into today's market, which we'll get into some numbers here in a little bit, hit the subscribe button. It shows that some people are just saying, I don't even care now. I just want the damn comic. It's true. It's it's very true. And, you know, I like to buy books with va with value on them still. OK, and some and some books I just have to buy because for Golden Age, you, you have to pay up because you'll just never see it again. So that happens. But for stuff with the Bronze Age. You know, and so much that I like and I'm familiar with, I like to buy with value. So I saw that with value. So that's the problem right now with Hulk 81s. You know, everyone's, there's a lot out there, but everyone's pricing them very aggressively. Um, so there's always new highs and new markers, and you're always just catching up. At some point, you just have to commit, okay, and be like, all right, for the two, three years I've been looking for a reasonable copy, the book's gone up. 40%, let's say, 35%. So you should have just bought it. At some point, you need to just buckle down on certain books and get them and have faith in the hobby and just get it out of your out of the system, right? And so that's that's my recommendation from anyone who's trying to get one if you can. Don't get me wrong, they're expensive. But they're always going to be more expensive. I think this is a good example. I mean, obviously not everyone can afford Hulk 181s. I sure as hell can't do that. But I did pull out a bunch of the same issue, yes, variants, yes, issue twos, but of like the same genre of book, you know, earlier in the show, which is, which were all around a hundred bucks, you know, give or take 50 or so. And it is the same type of mindset. If you're going to commit, if you're going to invest, putting it into something at the right time and going all in, it's risky. You know, you always have to do this with, with caution, but if you're, Doing it in a way where you feel confident and if something starts to go the opposite direction, you're willing to wait out the storm or drop it with a little bit of loss because the potential upside is worth it. It doesn't have to be a Hulk 181 that, that you do this with. You can sub out any comic book that's sitting here on the table with anything else. And I would understand and applaud and say, oh, wow, that's a, a, a risky or an awesome investment, but it's an investment nonetheless. Yeah, I mean, we can say the New Mutants 98. How many times have we seen that book spike, drop, spike again? Okay, I didn't write it out last time. I mean, I couldn't sell that book for $800 in 9.8. Okay, and this was only just a few years ago, I believe. Dude, within the last 10 years, I used to go to conventions and tap out 
of buying nine eight or New Mutants ninety eights because I found them so often and I had a budget. And it got to the point where it's like, I'm only going to be able to pick up seven of them right now because I don't want to pay more than $25 because it seems expensive at $25. And I would let other copies go that were high grade, nine six, could have been nine eights, but I didn't want to spend another 25 bucks. I got six, seven copies already. Good luck finding anything near that right now. Yeah, exactly. And like that book would sell for 12, 1500. I don't even know. It's hit 2000, right? Uh, Newsstands and Mark Jewelers. I mean, like the book has been up and down. It's currently, I think, at a low a little bit. But dude, at the start of last year, that book went nuts. Yeah. So just remember, guys, a first appearance and a key is still a key. Whether it goes up and down, depending where you buy it, is going to make a difference for you. If you can wait it out, and I'm not talking about like second tier and third tier, but we're talking about true key first appearances of true mainstream mainstream characters. That's always going to be the fact of that book. So if things go up and you buy it high, okay, which we've all done, okay, it may drop, but it, it will come back again because the character is either going to be one that stays around forever and will have its day again. And you just need to write it out. Now, if you're in the in and out game, yes, I can see that. Okay. You're going to have that pressures of making your money ASAP. Okay. But let's just say comics don't care about you like that. <laughs> you know, you That's make true. your decisions, you live by them, you have highs, you have lows. And, you know, sometimes it works out. And sometimes if it doesn't, you got to hold on to it a little longer or you sell it, take that money immediately and reinvest it and make it up on another book. It's all important information, I think, when it comes down to this hobby. Anytime I'm hit with a collector's decision to invest, to spec, to co anything, collect, there is something to be learned from it. And that's why I want to try to harness on this podcast because you're going through paying a good amount of money, doing things with a lot of books that people dream to own. Some members do own these books and it, it gives them some you know, just different ways to look at the hobby and, and how they're going about it. So they can achieve the most success because a lot of the times in order to get to this point, you have to make good decisions with other books and you kind of build to this point where you're getting the bigger books. Yeah. And this, I'm going to expand on what you're saying right now, because that makes sense too. Cause on top of this, look, I was very bullish on comics because I had faith in comics and it's worked out great for me, but I came in at a very good time, right? Right now it's very difficult to acquire what a lot of people have already acquired. And I understand that. You know, I feel very blessed to have gotten in what I did and what I have acquired in time. Plus, I do the hustle, so I'm always able to to really find stuff. But um, for others, again, it's it just seems like it's this amazing or incredible mountain you need to climb. But then you look again, and I would have said the same thing three years ago. Sure. And look, three years later, everything's even more money. Okay, and we're going to look from here again, this point, and it's all going to be even more money. So it's just... At some point, if you, you like, we said, like I just jumped in, and I, um, you'll have to acquire stuff and hope that your hobby continues. And I don't see it getting weak for any reason. And all I see is growth. I don't know about you. How do oh. you feel about it? Oh, I think that we're in for a really good time. Um, I think it growth is inevitable. There will be comics that won't maintain. There's always going to be fluctuation, as there has been for the duration of comics history. There's always going to be ebbs and flows for a lot of books, but I think that the market health long-term looks amazing, especially considering amping up what is being done on screen. I know we all talk about it and it comes out of a lot of people's mouths like, oh, you know, it's got movies all the time and now we have Disney Plus. And, you know, I think the ample amount of conversations that are happening as it pertains to being able to see Hawkeye on screen you know, seeing Joaquin Torres and, and, and all these awesome characters that a lot of people never thought would happen, it ends up kind of diluting what it actually means. This is a, a path forward that is going to be part of everyday life where like cartoons used to be, where we had multiple superhero cartoons that were always fresh every day, something new. It's going to be the equivalent on Disney Plus, but not just with cartoons, with every franchise that can keep its fandom happy. And the way you keep the fandom happy is by not just killing people off and then the franchise dies, which is a lot of how spec used to be. It used to be, oh, Bane's going to be in this movie, so we got to drop it right before the movie or 
decide if you want to keep it if he survives, right? And then will they continue? Probably not. We probably won't see Bane for another decade minimum. Not anymore. You know, Thanos came and went, but look at we're just watching them on what if. These characters are going to be in and out of of our lives as long as we live. There, I don't see fandoms ever really dying for any particular character. Look at Kingpin. No one thought Charlie Cox would reprise his role as Daredevil, really. Everything's fair game now. And with that type of reintroduction of any villain, and by the way, variants of villains, multiverse types of things, anybody could be anyone, we're always going to see mantles pass and we're going to see content from all of these comic books that it's going to make comics themselves, the collectibles, always relevant with an increasing amount of eyes on them with more collectors joining this community by the day. And that's people who are doing the collectible of comics themselves. Okay. And honestly, all this TV and uh, movie stuff is building generations to come of interest in heroes that they're grown up with. But we're seeing actual people enjoying digital comics themselves. When I say digital, I mean NFTs. Okay, when you go to a platform like Vivi and you're seeing consistent growth, you're seeing outsiders who truly don't know comics buying this stuff. And I say that because I've spoken to them and they tell me specifically, you're lucky because you know about comics and know what to buy. This is how they can get in on it. Okay. This is how they're able to yes. get into it and what they're comfortable with. They're not comfortable going to a convention, going on eBay, buying a book. They're comfortable with what this app says that they should pick up twice a week or so. Yep. And that's what they're doing and they're investing in. Okay. And I'm looking on Vivi. I'm like, why these particular books? Unless yep. they're just tied to something to happen. Okay, great. But I get what he's saying. I'm looking, I was like, okay, 70% of this stuff I would not buy in, in person. I would put my 30% efforts into these particular books. But what I'm saying is that we're seeing multiple avenues of ways for people to find interest in characters and the comic collectible itself. Absolutely. It, it proves the point that that right there, in my opinion, I could be wrong, but maybe we can flash back in the in, in front, you know in the in the future to this moment if I call this right. If there is a downturn, if the collectibles market ends up being hit with the effects of a recession or something like that, right? A, a, a damaged economy, whatever things things happen. The first place we're going to see it affect are those third party types of sites, however you want to call them. These these digital spaces, the NFT market, these kind of things that are not necessarily connected to the in-print comic book collector's market, those will suffer first because those communities, yes, have collectors like you and I are there. However, there's likely even more individuals who are never going to go to a convention that are part Starting the auction off at $1 for one minute like we always do. This is one of our favorite covers and you got it. A little bit of that what y'all been looking for, right? A little bit of that for what y'all been looking for, right? 